So we're still on 12, and I just wanted to cover some of these pieces because more because of the, the principles that are in them. Um, these principles are so, so critical, and, and, and like I was saying um, last week and a little bit just now, is that one of the most amazing things to me is that God put, in the, put into the foundation of Israel these things that they actually did not know that would take 1,500 years to actually come about. And that when you look at it from our point of view, and as we dive into the menorah, uh, we see these details of the Christian life. To me, that, that is just uh, magnificent. You know, it's just, uh, it just shows the awesomeness of God. Um, so let me see, where the first one? Let's read the verse over again, just to always orient ourselves. I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, that would be Jesus Christ. He's, um, when we talked a little bit about that last week, about, you know, identify the voice that talks to you. Not everything that is in your mind should be taken uh, seriously. <laughs> Hopefully you know that as a Christian. Um, and when I turned and I saw the seven golden lampstands, and go on from there. So the next piece that we, we, we kind of, some of the stuff we reviewed is that um, in, the, in the tabernacle, there was no natural light allowed in the, uh, inside the tabernacle itself, into, into the holy place. And this is, this is the equivalent of that. God does not accept our, um, he does not accept our light. Okay, uh, not that we have any, we actually do not. But he doesn't, he does not, God does not allow us to contribute to his plan. And uh, in my personal opinion, this is one of the great, uh, one of the great problems in Christianity today is that people want to add their stuff to God's, you know. And uh, that, that's like having the, uh, you know, the, God has the absolutely perfect plan. And, uh, and we want to add ours, okay. And what God's really saying, as, as well as with this piece right here, is that we, don't, we, only, we do not only not have light, but He can't accept it. And this is, this, is a principle, um, this is a principle that's really clear in that whenever you find yourself trying to add something to God's works, you must always understand the doctrine that God's plan is perfect without you. You know, and what does that mean? So, Gene uh, and I were talking about this the other day, and I said, well, I said, you know, one of the one of the biggest problems in Christianity today is that people uh, do not understand enough of the doctrines that are in the Scriptures to be able to apply them to their lives, to the every little piece of your life. And what happens? And, I'm not, and I don't mean for this to sound mocking. Uh, one of the things I always have to be very careful of, I should have been careful, I should have mentioned this last week, is that one of the ways that I teach sometimes is I mock. I, I mock, and, uh, uh, or I use uh, sarcasm, you know. And my assumption is that you always differentiate that sarcasm, but maybe sometimes you don't. And, uh, but there, there's lots of sarcasm in the Bible. People think that, there's, uh, that sarcasm is not acceptable. If, if that's what they really think, they have never understood the Bible. Uh, because when Jesus is saying to uh, Peter, get behind me, Satan, that's sarcasm. It's, it's also identifying the fact that at that moment, if you remember, uh, do you remember what that conversation was about? That's when, that's when uh, Peter's telling Jesus that, no, no, Lord, you're not going to die on the cross. No, no, not, not as long as I'm here. Not going to happen. Okay, and so in reality, that sounds really good to us, huh? He's trying to protect the Lord, and so what, what is? How does the Lord deal with that? He says, talk, looking right at Peter, and he says, "Get behind me, Satan!" In reality, at that moment, Peter is mimicking Satan's viewpoint, not God's. Okay, and that viewpoint is, guess what, Jesus? You don't have to go to the cross. Would that be Satan's preference? Absolutely, because what would that mean to us? We'd be lost. Okay, so that's Satan's viewpoint. But he uses that sarcasm. Um, one of my very favorite ones, and this is crude, so I'm just telling you up front, up front that this is crude, but it is in the Word of God. My wife knows where I'm going with this. It is in the Word of God, so it can't be too crude, right? Many of the things that are in the Word of God, the translators do not translate them correctly. 
And one of the reasons being is because they're very crude. They're very rude. They're meant to be rude. They're meant to be a slap in the face. Okay? And I'm going to give you one of these, and as soon as you hear it, you're going to go, oh, you had to use that one. Uh, if you remember what happens when Paul is talking about the Judaizers, right? Who are trying to bring the flesh into the church, and they're trying to say, well, you know, if you have faith in Christ, and you obey the Ten Commandments and the law, right? Remember this one? Yeah. That's what they're trying to do. The Judaizers are doing this, faith in Christ, plus... This. This hasn't gone away, has it? This actually is very true even today. This is very much a Christian point of view. In reality, it's faith in Christ and none of that. That's evil with respect to faith in Christ. It's evil. Okay? And how do, how do you know that? It's because the only thing that's acceptable to Jesus Christ and God the Father is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Can't bring anything else to it. Nothing. Zero. Okay? So we don't normally think about um, biblical principles or, or things about the Bible as being uh, used that way. But if you remember um, in, the, uh, in the temptation in the desert, you remember what happened when, when Satan actually used a verse to try to convince Jesus of something? Remember that? When he says... He says, he tells me, he says, well, jump off, jump off the angels. And he, and he quoted him a verse, remember? He quoted him a verse out of Psalms. He says, if you jump, the angels will come down and they will swoop you up so not even one toe of you will touch the ground. That's what he says to him. Satan says that to Jesus. Now, if you don't think, Jesus, if you don't think Satan's in cr crazy, <laughs> take this, take your ability to, like, like you would do, that would be like you correcting Jesus by using a verse. Okay? Uh, <laughs> I don't know about you, but that sounds really dangerous, right? But it didn't stop Satan one second. And do you remember what Jesus' response to it? He, he actually quoted out of Deuteronomy. Um, in fact, every defense that Jesus did was out of Deuteronomy. Right? Every single verse that Jesus quoted in the temptation was out of Deuteronomy. Um, but <clears throat> he says, do not put the Lord your God to a test. He corrected him. What he was really telling him is that, Satan, you misapplied that verse. And that's because Satan's stupid when it comes to the Word of God. He doesn't understand it. Try He'll try anything. That's right. And, and that's what we have to watch out for. So the, the whole thing about the perfect plan is that God has a perfect plan. Uh, the menorah has that picture in it. The lampstands have that picture in it. And that we need to understand that picture of these lampstands in this verse through the menorah to help us understand where we fit, okay? Um, so, in this case, what, um, what it's telling us is that in the menorah itself, the Holy Spirit is the pure oil that's in the menorah, and, the, um, and it's the only thing that's acceptable. There's nothing in the wick itself that's acceptable, uh, yet the flame encompasses it. And that flame is the is the Word of God. Okay? Um, the mockery I was making about the verse was this. Uh, many people ask, uh, for some reason people ask me, says, well, is it good to memorize verses? And my, my joke to them is, and it's a sarcasm, is that, my joke to them is that, yeah, that's all you have. Okay? Now, many people would look at that and say, that doesn't sound very Christian like rich. Okay? And what I mean by that is that a verse itself is, um, the verse itself is just like a, um, it's the smallest piece that you can do. Most of the time when people memorize a verse, they actually don't understand the doctrine that's in it. In all these, there's, there's principles. Okay? Uh, the principles of God are called Bible doctrine. Okay, And those principles can apply to many things. And it's because Christians do not pull the principles out of them, they don't get certain things that apply in the rest of their lives. Okay, In reality, um, the Word of God has the answer to every single question. All of them, without exception. But Christians cannot necessarily pull out the verses to make them do that. And the reason is, is that they don't understand the principle that's behind the verse. 
When an example of that is a lot of people really like uh, um, Joe's uh, message last week. And I'm not poking at Joe's message. I'm just talking about Jonah. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> in reality, the book of Jonah, when you read it to your children, and I'm going to use the word whale because it's easier. It's not, not a whale, it's a big fish. We all know that. But the story is not about a whale getting a guy and spitting him up on, on the shore. Right? It's not about that. So when you teach your children and you teach a Sunday school class all about the story itself, you have lost everything that God wanted to teach with those verses. What did he want to teach? There's a million things. One, certainly one of them is that, guess what? You can't run away from God. Yeah? God will do what it takes so it's better not to get swallowed by a whale for three days and spit out on the shore. Okay? It's better just to suck it up. Um, there's, it tells you that the grace of God is enormous. Um, the Ninevites, remember the town where was that? The Ninevites were some of the most evil people on the face of the earth. And God had a perfect right to wipe them out. Uh, what was it, 120,000 of them? He had a perfect right to. They were evil people. Um, God gave him a warning. And if you remember the part in Noah where Joe was talking about, it says, you know, the part, and Noah says this in Zell, he says, he says, one of the things I hated about your instructions, I knew what you wanted me to do, but I knew how gracious you were. And I hate your gracious. I don't want you to use it to these people over here. I want you to smoke them. <laughs> yeah. um, so the whole point is of that is that there's these deep underlying principles there that you have to know. You have to know that when you do something really, really stupid, you know if I didn't say if you do something really stupid, I said when you do something really stupid. <laughs> Um, when you do something really, really stupid, you can know that God is not going to smoke you. He's not. He, he's not that kind of God. He is a gracious God. He is a kind God. It is His desire to get you to holiness because He knows that walking a holy life will protect you and bless you and keep you. So all that He does is to help you to understand that. that. That's the God. That's, that's what Jonah is supposed to teach. Okay? Um, it also teaches about the pettiness of people. Okay? Remember with Jonah in the, in the plant? Yeah. Is that petty? Yeah. Yeah, he's a really, really petty guy. Okay? Uh, until, uh, and I told Joe the end of the story. I said, you know, I said, you know most people do not know it, but when they did the, <clears throat> when they did the excavating uh, in Nineveh, they found a tomb. And then on that tomb, the name Jonah was on that tune. And what it tells you is that Jonah did figure it out. Unlike the end of that story. He did figure it out. He became a man of grace. He went back and evangelized and helped bring those people to a maturity that lasted 100 years. Now Nineveh, if you know history, was destroyed um, by Nebuchadnezzar and Astyages when they got together. And um, like 612 or something like that, B.C. But they got together and they wiped it out. Okay, but that was 100 years after Jonah had made that trip. So in reality, he gave them grace before judgment, which we're going to hear a lot about, for 100 years. That's good to know. It's good to know in this country. <laughs> right, now, right now, we are on the grace of God because God should have smoked us. There's, there's nothing about the United States today that represents Jesus Christ. Okay? But we have this going for us, and God is hoping, just like the 120, that we will turn back to Him. Okay? So those are the principles. There's a million principles in there, but that's some of them. Um, so these principles are really important to pull out of them because they help us understand. Um, when you want to do something good uh, for God, okay, when you want to do something good for God, the best good you can do is stay out of His way. Amen. Don't give anything. When you do something... <laughs> out of your own ability to think that this God would really like this. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to fast. Okay? I'm going to, 
which is another word for a diet, Christian diet. But I'm going to fast, um, and I'm mocking that too, but there's actually a piece of fun. But when you decide you're going to do something, I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that for God. I'm not going to say another bad word as long as I'm going to be nice to my kids, I'm going to be nice to my... I, I, I have a list. Guess what? <laughs> they fit over here. God would prefer that you humble yourself, that you let Him work through you, that you obey what He has told you in every single moment of your life. That you would look at the things that God's put before you and say, how would the Lord have me handle this? And please don't use what would Jesus do. Okay? <laughs> please don't use that. Okay? Uh, the problem is that most Christians don't know what Jesus would do. They don't know. Why don't they know it? Because they have not discerned the principles that come out of the Word of God. They haven't discerned them. Let me tell you one of the examples here. And I'm going to pick on this one purposely. It'll be, and then we'll get back to some real Bible study. Okay? Um, some people actually have the audacity to think that we should have a Christian president. Okay? Now, some of the worst stinkers in our Congress today... The majority of them, the majority of the Congress that we have today are born-again believers, Christians. Yet they're worthless to this country. Why? They don't understand the principles. They think, they have the, they have, they're crazy enough to think that maybe, being, maybe getting rid of guns will help things. See, guns have a mind of their own. They kill people indiscriminately. That's sarcasm, sorry. <laughs> um, but you know, what I'm saying is that they don't know, and that's the problem. Is that you, don't wanna, you don't want somebody to be a Christian. You want somebody who has good values. Good values. Good values are... Now, if, if, you're, if you're looking for somebody for the church, you want a Christian, right? But if you're picking somebody for the country... Unless that Christian understands the values, the good values to run a government and what's right and good, he's worthless. In fact, actually, he's usually in the way. He actually, people like Jimmy Carter, probably the worst president we've had since the latest one. One of the reasons is because his Christianity clouded his judgment and he actually didn't understand the principles. He actually aligned himself with communism, for those of you who know that history. Um, because it looks good. Liberalism sometimes looks good. It looks very kind. But in reality, it is, it's demonic. It's evil. It's from Satan's own words. And so it's important to discern these principles so that when something comes before you, you're not emotional. You just sit there and say, what would God do? What does he say in his word? And then you rightly discern that principle and you apply it. That's That's Christianity. The reason that's not going on today is because these principles are not taught. We're taught these other weird things. You know, you know I mock them all the time. We're taught to be nice. Okay? Being nice is a byproduct of being holy. A byproduct means it's a result of it. It's not a goal. It's a result. Okay? Um, and there's sometimes you're not supposed to be nice. Okay? Um, in criminality, you're supposed to put the guy in jail. If he's committed a certain crime, you execute him. Have you read Romans 13? You execute them. That's what happens to him. Have you read the book about where God sends uh, Joshua and says, wipe out every man, woman, and child in Jericho? Those are principles. If you get that mixed up with the rubbish that... Hold on, I'm in dangerous territory. If you get them with the rubbish that is put on things like the Sermon on the Mount, uh, and, I'm, and I'm saying the Sermon on the Mount is perfect. The problem is if it's misapplied, it does weird things. It does bad things. Okay? So you have to be able to discern uh, whether it's talking about your neighbor. So if the guy next door doesn't like me and he says bad things about me, I'm, I'm supposed to pray for him. But if that same neighbor comes into my yard with a gun to shoot me, I'm supposed to shoot him dead. Okay? Those are two different principles. Okay? And they apply just exactly like that. Those are uniformly applied on every single place in the Bible. There's no confusion in them. When we have an enemy, we're supposed to wipe them out. 
That enemy is not the enemy that lives in, in the scriptures. The enemy is talking about in the scriptures is the one who is our neighbor who does not like us, who says bad things about us. For him, we pray for him. We try to make that light shine so good that he feels bad about it. That's another verse. Okay? And that this light here, he will see with his soul and he will feel the shame of what he has done. That's Christianity. Okay? Um, okay, so let's get some real verse here, sir. But the whole point is to look at it from this point of view is that it's not the verse, it's the doctrines. Remember the doctrines. Those are the principles that help you out. Not only that, but they also are uniform. Principles are never, are never violated in verses. Okay? But verses have the ability to violate a principle if it's not applied right. So you have to understand the application. Um, let me see. Let's go to John 16, 14. Um, mm, 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 mm. Um, this is uh, with respect to it says after the ascension Christ continues to reveal the truth through the spirit and he says he will bring glory to me by taking what is mine and making it known to you who is that? Jesus Jesus is speaking but who is he speaking about? He's speaking about the Holy Spirit. He's going to be the one who provides this truth and this life so that the light of the world, that's what he's talking about, make it known to you, uh, light of the world, Jesus Christ, light can shine through you, through that oil. Not the wick. We talked about the wick before, right? Remember the wick. If the wick gets a little charred, what has to happen the high priest, Aaron, has to go and clip it. Clip it, just take off the legs and say, okay, you know something, that's, that's not going to burn well if it has carbon on it. So I have to clip it, make it nice and pure, over and over. And it happened every day, okay? So this light is provided by Jesus Christ, which is the Word of God, because that's what the part here says. He will make it known to you. Holy Spirit will make what known to you? Bible doctrine. Because that's what you knew. That is the light that goes to the world. Okay? That's the truth of Jesus Christ. Okay? Better get some of this water on where we are. Um, 15. All that belongs to the Father is mine. God the Father has given it to him. That is why the Spirit will take from what is mine, he owns it, and make it known to you. Okay? This tells us this principle here, but also tells us that if you are not in fellowship okay, with the Holy Spirit, this cannot happen. The oil stops, and what happens to the light? Goes out. That's the darkness. That's right. And so this is what this is. Okay. Let's go to... Oh, I'll get that over John 1 4. Kind of going backwards a little bit. I was trying to keep them in the same verse and still make sense of them. The same book. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. And it's talking about Jesus Christ. So it's confirming this light. Okay? And that light. We're familiar with that light. And that light is life. This is the spiritual life. Okay? There is no other. Okay? You being good does not qualify or as not only not acceptable to God, but it actually falls short of the standard. So, what does fall clearly with the Word of God? Okay? And we've talked about this. Okay? So, it is clearly the Holy Spirit's power. It is clearly the Word of God. And it is you saying, well, I use positive volition, saying yes. Okay? 
And there's one more piece here, okay? It is also you not allowing sins to be part of you. So, in order to get rid of that, 1 John 1, 9. Because, in reality, if you are filled with the Holy Spirit, and you have the Word of God, which you do, okay, because you learn it, and you say, yes, if you have sins, we know that the Lord cannot use us, right? So, how do we deal with that? We confess them, that's right. And we, do we confess them <laughs> with emotions and tears? And, no. God does, why not? Because God does not accept emotions. Emotions do not qualify. Thoughts, your thoughts, our thoughts, do not qualify. My ways are high above your ways. So, how you feel about it does not impress God one tiny bit. Now, that's kind of hard to take because you... Yeah, yeah. No, I want to bring something. Come on, Lord. I feel really sincere. I'm very emotional. Now, is there anything with emotions? No. Emotions are a result. Okay? They're not a goal. So when people sit and say, you know something, I've, I confessed it, but I don't feel like it's gone. Why is that? Because you've allowed your arrogant thoughts to hold sway over God's word. Okay? God says, you confess them to me, they're gone. As far as the east is from the west. You keep talking about them, but I don't know what you're talking about anymore. That's sarcasm. Okay? In reality, when you confess your sins, God wipes them out and restores your righteousness perfectly. That's what 1 John 1 says. And if you think differently, it's because you're arrogant. Okay? It's your arrogance that's in the way. What does arrogance cause you to do? Return to that line right there. <laughs> sins. Ah, I found out again. You know, it's one thing when Satan red cards you, and that's a soccer term, red cards you. It's even stupider when you do it yourself, okay? So, if God says something is true, and you are made perfect, believe that that's true, so that you don't re -sin and therefore take yourself out of the game, okay? So, this is, this is what is required, right here. Now, this is actually, as is, is, is funny as this sounds, this is actually simplistic Bible doctrine. It is the simple basics. It's the thing that the day you got saved, before the evening was up, somebody should have told you that. Because this is the only thing that counts. It's the only thing. Nothing else counts. So whatever you did outside of fellowship with the Holy Spirit that was not consistent with the Word of God, the positive volition you would have that, and if you still had sins remaining that you did not confess, you were out of fellowship and they counted for zero. Okay? They qualify as wood, hay, and stubble. And they will be dealt with on the judgment seat of Christ, but they will be burned. The tragedy of Christianity today is I think those bonfires in heaven are going to be really, really big. <laughs> Not because people don't want to, it's because they don't know. Okay? They don't know them. It's a tragedy. So, when I first heard this thing, one, I had been teaching church for nine years, and I was like, ah, tell me it's not true. <laughs> tell me I have not wasted so much of my Christianity. I'm sure, I'm sure I got one or two percent in there during that time. But once I understood this, I thought, oh, it's not what I think is right. It's what God says is right. Do I find these principles in the Word of God? I do, everywhere. Those are God's principles. I don't get the right to change them. Okay? They're just absolutely unequivocally true. So, 535. John 535. Um, <laughs> this is the principle we were talking about. Um, the pastors of the church in the menorah where the light is there. And that um, menorah is the, uh, is, the, is the light that comes out of that church. Uh, there's a lot of principles in there. Um, 
But let's read the verse first, uh, and then we'll come back to it. Um, 535. John was a lamp that burned and gave light, and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. Um, this tells us that this confirms this principle. Okay? John was this. John was one of the very few people in that time period who had what? I know that it's always a, it's always that trick question when a when a teacher oh, asks a question. The Holy Spirit, that's right. He had the Holy Spirit, so he produced this light. He was the light of the world. He was that light to introduce the light, okay, of Jesus Christ. He was the uh, the Elijah, okay. But this is the principle. So I'm just showing you the principle is there, uh, and we know that Jesus is the light. So we understand this principle is true. Um, let's we can find Psalms 36 9. This is one that's talking about, if, if it's, uh, it's the title of the Psalm 36 is The Wicked in Contrast to God's Mercy. And this is talking about the Lord. And we can see very clearly for that. It says, For you, for with you is the fountain of life. And in your light we see light. Okay? Um, who's it talking about there? Jesus Christ. Okay? We know this is true of Jesus Christ. Okay? Um, in the light that Jesus Christ carried in him that allowed him to produce every miracle that he produced. And, and this is the, I think it comes in later on. Well, actually it comes in the verse after, after this one. Uh, 36 through I think 37. Where Jesus talks about his testimony and his light. But this same light, this same Holy Spirit, is what the humanity of Jesus Christ used. Uh, one of the principles that's not understood real well for some reason, I'm not, not sure why, um, is that Jesus Christ, the man, never used the power of the second person. He never used this power. He always used this power. That one. Okay. Um, and if we remember the studies we did back, he, he had it without limit. Uh, without limit. Okay. And he did that for a very specific reason. He, he did that um, because he had to show us the model that would be required of us. Okay. Um, in reality, the model of the Christian life is identical to the model that Jesus Christ as a man used when he was on earth. Okay? We know that this is, this is why the, the, uh, the unforgivable sin comes up. The unforgivable sin is when you attribute something that is done by the Holy Spirit to Satan. Uh, interestingly enough, you don't hear anybody curse the Holy Spirit, huh? Isn't that interesting? You don't. You hear, of course, Christ all the time. But you never see them Christ, the, the Holy Spirit. Um, but what's interesting about this one here is that he has that, uh, he, he produced every miracle that Jesus Christ ever did, he did with the Holy Spirit. Okay? And the other part is that he never used any instructions on the plan. His plan, his total, complete plan, was from the Father. How do we know that? He says, I don't do what I want to do. I only do what I'm, my Father tells me to do. Okay? Guess what, guess what plan this is? This is us. This is us. In reality, that's us. That better be Jesus, right? That's what I was going to do to Joe sometime. When my phone accidentally rang, I would say, Jesus, hold on a second. Joe, I got this. And so far, nobody's wrong, so we're okay. So, so this exact plan is our plan. In reality, our plan is to follow the Word of God that God the Father has given to us. Jesus Christ did not design that plan. God the Father did. We have the same plan that He has. Okay? We have the same power that He has. Okay? 
There's a verse that says, and I'm just going to bring it up for fun, to jar you. You know how I like to do that. Push it a little bit. It says, in Christ I can do all things, right? The word Christ is not actually in that verse. It says, in Him I can do all things. I suspect, given this model, that this Him is this Him. Okay? And that's why God the Holy Spirit removed it from that verse. It is Christ. Christos is not in that verse. Okay? This is where the power. When Jesus said, I'm leaving, but I'm sending somebody with power who's going to help you understand and going to give you power. Wait for the power. That's what he's talking about. That's what he's talking about. Our power is in God the Holy Spirit. Because that's the protocol of God the Father. And if you're not in fellowship with Him, if you don't follow these basics, you are out of fellowship, and you may be doing really nice things that everybody loves you about, but in reality, it won't count for nothing when you get to the judgment seat of Christ. So, all that to say, it's really important to understand this dynamics. If you want your life to count in time and in eternity, that's the model. Okay? That's put in. This is the model of the menorah. It is confirmed by it. 1,500 years before Jesus Christ was even born. Okay? The humanity. Okay, so what else we have? Uh, got that one. This one here. We're almost done. We're almost here. Now we're doing good. Now, for people who know my class, who have been in my class for years, some of have, this is one of my very f favorite pieces of verses in the Bible. It's... Uh, It is very instructional. It tells you there is a... We could, take, we could take these verses, and I'm positive we could spend a year on them uh, because they just have that much doctrine in them. And, they're, and they're, it's really great stuff. So let's read. Um, and this tells, you, uh, th this tells you one thing. One of the things that's really helpful in this verse, and I want you to watch for it, is that... Um, being in fellowship um, or not being in fellowship are mutually exclusive. Okay, that word means that you're either in one or you're the other, but you're never halfway. Okay? So that's an important thing to think about. So you're either producing gold and silver, or wood, hay, and stubble. Every second of your life, you're doing one or the other. Okay? But you can't do them both. You're either here or you're here. Okay? Um, and that seems very, I like the word exacting. Okay? In case you haven't figured it out yet, God is very exacting. The Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing even to the soul and the spirit. Have you tried to divide the soul and the spirit conceptually? You can't. I mean, they're like, I don't know what they are. They're kind of, I don't, they're God stuff. You know, they're all wrapped it together. But that's how sharp it is. Okay? And that's how God is. God is, you can believe on Jesus Christ and be saved, you can believe on God the Father and go to hell. You can say a prayer to God the Father and it will be heard if you're in fellowship and if you're a believer. This is why last week I said, if you're not a believer, don't tell people to pray. God doesn't listen to it. Okay? Um, you can have them pray. What they can pray for is, Lord, save me. I believe in your Son. He hears that prayer just like that. Okay? Um, but my whole point with that is that you have to have this piece here. Okay? So when you're in fellowship, uh, well, like, let me finish the thing. You can pray to God the Father and you will be listened to. You can pray to Jesus Christ and God will not listen to your prayer. Why? It's his protocol. He is exacting. Okay? When Jesus is asked, how should we pray? 
We all know the answer to that question. You pray to the Father in the name of the Son and the power of the Holy Spirit. There's no second way to pray. You don't pray to the Holy Spirit. Your prayer will not be listened. If you believe in Jesus Christ, and that's pretty, that's pretty, what's, that, uh, what's the word I was looking for? Is, you know, God requiring us to believe only in Jesus is very narrow-minded, right? I'm speaking for the world. <laughs> it's, it's one name. One name out of the billions of people who have lived. One name and one name alone. Nothing else will save you. That's exacting. Right? The way. The way. Yeah, there's not a second way. There's no plan B. <laughs> Jesus Christ is plan A. There's no plan B. Zero. You cannot be saved by any other way. If you never sinned, we know that's impossible. We're just <laughs> hypothetical. If you never sinned, now don't make me laugh because you're going to hurt me here. My, my, my chest is hurting here. But if you never ever sinned, guess where you would end up when you died? In hell. Because it's not sins that keep you out of hell. The sins have already been paid for on the cross. They're not an issue anymore. That's the great news. Guess what? No matter how off you are, and I know that you're a rotten person, if you reach out to Jesus Christ right this second, all the sins have been taken care of, you can be saved. Just like that. Church won't follow nothing. Okay? That's what I thought. Got to come in to check these, check these rafters, you know. Make sure they're good. Okay? So, it's either in fellowship or not in fellowship. There's nothing in between the two. Now, what is this here? 